a heart is heavy. And it's heavy because last week I was in New England. Um, the president of the South New England Conference asked me to come in and talk to the senior adults in the main pavilion about the need to reach, reclaim, and retain our young adults in the Seventh-day Adventist context. Only to get home and, and get a call from a friend of mine in Charleston, um, a young lady who has come here several times when we have brought in Vashon Mitchell and more recently when we brought in CeCe Winans. And she lives in Charleston and she just sent me a one-line text. There was a shooting in a church in, in, in Charleston. And my mind immediately began to wrestle with what, was it in your church? What church was it? And I found myself kind of slipping into that, oh, okay, it didn't happen in an Adventist church. And, and, then, and then when I, when I woke up the next day and, and gave her a call, and she informed me where it had taken place. The Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina is no run-of-the-mill church. This is not a church that is just, you know, happened to be on a corner in, you know, the, the, the regular ghetto neighborhood on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. That this church, this church had its founder executed for what the state deemed then as a slave revolt. This church was burned to the ground after the founder and several of his colleagues were executed for inciting a slave revolt. The church would be built later on, Mother Emanuel AME Church, and would continue to be a lighthouse for abolitionists and for civil rights movements. Martin Luther King would come there in the 60s and he would uh, galvanize the South Carolinians, more specifically those in Charleston, to go out and, as we would say, rock the vote. Coretta Scott King would lead a march in Charleston, South Carolina, sometime later. But that was just the church. Gina, just the church. If we just look at what the church represented. But then, Reverend Clement, I know his name. This was a man who was the youngest African American, the youngest African American to be invited to the House and then to the Senate. He, he was not just the run-of-the-mill reverend. This was a man who believed very strongly about civil rights. It was, it was, it was Clem who organized the march and organized the protest when Walter Scott was gunned down. It was Clem who began pushing in the House and in the Senate that police officers should wear cameras. This was who this man was. So when we, when we look at this, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, friends of mine, beloved of God, please receive in your spirit what I'm attempting to say to you this morning. This was not arbitrary. This was not coincidence. I mean, if we just look at that by itself, but then when we add the fact that the young man went into the church and for an hour wrestled in himself as to whether or not he should commit this hate crime, this terrorist act, he wrestled with himself for an hour and said he almost, Sister Johnson, didn't go through with it because the people were so nice to me. I, I, I was left to conclude, because I'm a Christian twin and I don't really believe in coincidence, I was left to conclude that this was not, as they have characterized it, a thoughtless 
No, 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 no. Somebody thought this thing out and thought this thing through. And, and, and here is, here is, here is. I am, I, I watched the media coverage. And as I watched the media coverage, Sally, I, I thought, man, had this been a Muslim. Come on, sir. An entire religious group would have been characterized as terrorist had it been a Muslim, had it been a black man, an entire race of people would have been characterized as thugs. Now this is nothing against, I don't have, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not leading a charge against white people. I just want to state the facts as they appear to me. But because this was a white man, right. And he was called, I, I need you to note, if you watch the media, he was called a, quote, lone gunman, end quote, with a, quote, mental disorder, end quote, who it was absolutely necessary that every news media person said was, quote, innocent until proven guilty, end quote. I said, well, what was Mike Brown? Wow. I said, well, what was Walter Scott? Wow. I, I said, I said, what, 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 what were any of the, what was the young lady who in her bathing suit thrown on the ground by a grown man where he put his knee in her back and anyone who may have been saying to him, hey, she's innocent until proven guilty, was drawn down on. So I, I wrestled with this, and I wrestled with a number of things, and I just got to be honest this morning. I wrestled with the fact that the president of our general conference issued no statement. But then I was encouraged by my president, Dan Jackson. Dan Jackson issued a statement saying that we would stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Calvin, while I was encouraged by this, while I was encouraged by this, I thought to myself, I said, where has the black voice in the Seventh-day Adventist church been throughout the civil rights movement and while these egregious acts have been perpetrated against unarmed, innocent African Americans, black people, however you want to characterize them, to the extent that when a black man is shot down in the streets, what the media does is roll out his arrest record as though that justifies them killing a man who is and was unarmed, whereas this young man earned a psychiatric evaluation. This young man earned a security detail. This young man earned a bulletproof vest. And I just think, I just think, y'all, when I, when, I, when, I, when I look at the Bible, can, can, I, can I talk about when I look at the Bible for a minute? When I look at the Bible, the one time I see Jesus actually in church stand up and read anything, do you know what he chose to read? He chose to read a quote from Isaiah that spoke about the necessity of social justice. And so I stand and declare that any church that is not at the forefront of ensuring that the issue of social justice is paramount is not a church called after the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so by all means, preach the three angels' message, but make sure you preach social justice. By all means, talk about the sanctuary, but make sure you're at the forefront of social justice. By all means, talk about the Sabbath, 
but make sure that it is in the context and the framework of ensuring that young women aren't thrown on the ground, that black men aren't shot down when they're unarmed, that we are innocent until proven guilty, and that we might have a collective psychological disorder because we were raped from our country, our language was stolen from us, our culture was stripped of us, and we were told that we were three-fifths of a man. And I declare, we need some black men with respectable voices to stand up and say, here and no further. Here and no further, because while it's not happening in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we say, oh man, that's terrible. When it's not your family getting gunned down, we say, oh, that's terrible. When it's not someone close to you, we say, oh, that's terrible. But the reality is, if you look on the TV, and look in your house, that is you. That was your daughter. That is your son. That is your brother. That is your nephew and that is your uncle. And so Metropolitan, it is with a heavy heart that I challenge us this morning, but that I then ask that we pray for the family, the families of Mother Emmanuel AME Church. And more, and more specifically like, like, y'all, I'm serious, man. The man was 41 years old, Uncle Duan, with little kids. What's going to happen to his family? What would happen to your family should this have happened to you? Dr. Martin Luther King once said, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And if we don't heed that clarion call that is still echoing from his grave, that echoes from just 15 minutes from here, if we don't heed this call, soon one of your pastors will be standing over one of your children or even one of your pastors might be gunned down while trying to lead you in prayer and to the throne of your Savior. If we don't lend our voice soon and very soon, this could very well be any one of us. And so I'm going to ask that we not only have a moment of silence, but I'm gonna ask that my pastor come and offer a word of prayer. But brothers and sisters, I, I'm a firm believer in Jesus Christ. I, I'm a firm believer in prayer, but it wasn't prayer alone that got us our right to vote. It wasn't prayer alone that got us the right to sit here all pretty and handsome enjoying our First Amendment rights, it wasn't prayer alone. These rights that we enjoy have been seeded with the blood of our ancestors. And at some point, we're going to have to think beyond ourselves and realize that someone somewhere, not just the devil, it's, it's easy to spiritualize it, but this is so coincidental as to almost be unbelievable. It is as though someone is trying to force our hand. It is as though someone is trying to force the hand of the African-American, Afro-Caribbean, and black person in America, saying, well, we shot one boy, what did they do? We shot another boy, what did they do? We shot another boy, what they, they, they just not responding. What, what could we do? Let's attack them at the heart of what has been their nerve center since we brought them to this country. Let's kill people in a church. Let's pray.
Let's have a moment of silence for the nine people that lost their lives and for the families that went to his indictment and issued the forgiveness of Jesus. And so as we have a moment of silence for, for them, unfortunately, this young man was someone's tool, whether it was somebody on this planet or wickedness in high places. And so even his soul is not beyond redemption. So let's remember him in our prayer and moment of silence. And after our moment of silence, Pastor Billingsley will lead us in prayer for them. And even as Jesus said, pray for those who despitefully use and persecute you. For the young man, Mr. Ralph. God of all weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on our way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, God, you're going to have to keep us now. Keep us forever in this path, we pray. God, we don't understand it. We cannot explain it. We don't have the words to even comfort somebody in a time like this. But we do know that somewhere deep in our souls, we feel the hurt and we feel the pain because it's us. And so our prayer first is, God, in some miraculous way, if you will just cover these families now and do what only you can do, God. Mount them up on wings as eagles. Raise them above the hurt and the pain. Remove doubt. The enemy will want some family member to doubt and blame you, God. Remove doubt from their hearts so that they can still trust in you despite the pain. God, we pray for us in this Seventh-day Adventist church. Sometimes we are just too relaxed. We've been a blessed people, but that could cause us to sometimes be unconcerned. Wake us up, God, from our sleep and our slumber. Cause us to recognize the times in which we live. Take away the petty foolishness from us. Remove the cares and the issues that distract us from what we should really be concerned about. What doth the Lord require of us but to do justly? To love mercy? And to walk humbly with our God. Help us, Jesus. Help us to walk in that path. And Father, the days you told us will get rough. Prepare us, Jesus, for hard times. 
And we know the only way we will stand is when we are rooted and grounded in the word of God. So bless us today. We're thankful that we're here, that we're breathing, but let us never take that for granted. Let us do whatever we can to make sure that we stand for right. Even in our church, let us stand for right. And when it's all said and done, God, we don't want to lose our souls. Please, Jesus, save us in your kingdom. And somehow, because of your blood, save this young man who committed this crime. Thank you for the hearts of the people who are willing to forgive. Teach us how to love our enemies, how to bless those that curse us, how to do good to those who despitefully use us, so that when you come, God, we can hear from your lips, well done, good and faithful servants. We pray this in the strong name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus, who died for these nine people, and in the name of the Holy Spirit now who will keep these families until you come to get them and raise their loved ones and take them home. May we be counted in that number. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Cut of a weary years. Cut of our You can sing. You can sing. Thou who has brought us out far on the way, Thou who has by Thy might led us into the light, keep us for. Yeah. 